lot of the work about memory taxonomies in particular was really coming about at a time when there was great optimism about taking our psychological categories that, you know, the cognitive psychology had done a really good job of making precise and imaging was starting up and we were like, we we're just trying to line everything up. I think of it as like really bound up in that optimism that as I see it has come sort of crashing down. So the philosophy of imagination has been an area in philosophy for a lot longer than memory. Um, but I think our understanding of what imagination is or the many different purposes to which it could be put has is sort of all over the place. I mean, I think a lot of the early computer designs are very much based on how we thought memory worked. It was a sort of sensible way of thinking about memory, of having, right. you know, like taking everything, giving it an address, <laughs> storing it, and then calling it up by that address, and then here we go. Um, and that kind of view of memory in some respect or another is sort of in the background of a lot of philosophical and theoretical works that people wrote at those times. This is Brain Inspired. Greetings. I am Paul. My guest today is uh, Sarah Robbins. Sarah is a philosopher at the University of Kansas, and she's one of a handful of philosophers specializing in memory these days. Much of her work uh, focuses on memory traces, which is roughly the idea that somehow our memories leave a trace in our minds. And we discuss memory traces themselves, how they relate to the engram, uh, which Sarah calls a kind of scientized subset of memory traces, one that is more focused on the physical implementation of a memory trace in our brains. Uh, we also discuss how memory traces may cross-cut the categories of memory in our current uh, more or less accepted taxonomy of memory, which divides kinds of memory, like episodic memory, implicit memory, semantic memory, declarative and non-declarative memory, and so on. There are challenges to the idea of having a stable engram-like uh, memory trace in our brains. For example, knowing that all of our molecules and synapses are constantly changing and turning over and being recycled, uh, which is often called neural dynamics. So we discuss that, and another challenge um, called memory consolidation, which refers to the process of transferring our memory traces from an early unstable version to a more stable long-term uh, version in a different part of the brain. If you're into neuroscience, you've probably heard of the um, recent technology called optogenetics, which allows neuroscientists to use light to precisely activate and record a defined population of neurons. And we talk about how that tool has affected how we think about memory. There's an ongoing debate as well in neuroscience and philosophy and psychology uh, about the distinction between memory and imagination. Are they essentially the same thing? Why or why not? So we discuss that. We also talk about whether memory's function is future-oriented or not, and whether we want to build AI with our kind of often faulty memory, uh, or if it should have perfect memory. So this episode is kind of a tour of many of the current issues in the philosophy of memory, um, many of which uh, Sarah writes about. Uh, by the way, apologies if you're watching, her video gets uh, slightly grainy for a couple prolonged stretches, so I hope that's not too distracting. I link to a handful of Sarah's work if you want to dive deeper from what you hear uh, on this episode. Go to braininspired.co slash podcast slash 157. If you want full episodes of Brain Inspired and to join our Discord community, or just to show your appreciation, um, support it on Patreon for super cheap. Thank you to my current Patreon supporters. You can go to braininspired.co to learn more about that. All right, here's Sarah. I didn't know that the philosophy of memory was like a, a, a thing, you know, and, and until I came across your chapter and then started diving in more. I mean, there's a philosophy of everything these days, isn't there? Yeah, I think I think philosophy of memory is sort of proof of concept of that idea. So it wasn't a thing that long ago. Um, so I a lot in a lot of ways share your s surprise and fascination, um, <laughs> pleasantly, at least. Um, yeah, it was a decade ago that I was writing, finishing my dissertation. And at that point, it would have been presumptuous to say that there was a philosophy of memory. There were a few of us starting to do more of that sort of thing. And of course, philosophers have always talked about memory here and there. But in, in terms of it being an area of philosophy that people 
outside of doing that work would recognize as a topic, it just really wasn't the case. So it's been a very, hmm. um, a very active decade moving in that direction. Okay, so I, I want to uh, ask you this um, <laughs> before we move on. I just had the thought, you know, how philosophers talk about making moves, you know, and then I made that move and I'm making this move. Where where did that come from? Like, what what is the deal with making a move? <laughs> It's a great question. I think philosophers really, maybe it's because we don't have labs and we aren't doing, right. we, we crave action verbs, I think that especially, you know, physical action verbs that um, people often talk about, you know, going in directions, making moves. Um, and I do think there has, maybe because of the history of the discipline, people lately have tried to move away from a lot of combative metaphors. So making it sound like you're oh. um, started doing warlike uh, activities when you <laughs> so maybe moving is less um, aggressive, and, but still mm. assertive and physical in a way that, yeah, um, I don't know. <laughs> you don't know where it came from though? Like how old is it? I, I don't even... I don't even know, you know, how to how, how I would look that up even. Yeah, it's a great question because I think it's mostly I don't know that you see it so much in the writing, but you certainly see it in the way that people talk and engage with yeah. each other. Um, right. And yeah, it's Descartes so, wasn't making moves, was he? <laughs> well, he certainly was, but I don't know that he called. I don't know that he would have <laughs> called it that. Um, okay. Yeah, that's I'm good. I actually I'll ask around. I think it's so. That's so in the in the water of that we swim in that I I actually have never really thought about where that came from. So, yeah, I I because I, 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 I don't know if I just came across the phrase the other day or, or what, but um, it's so vague and like I don't actually really know what it means. You know, it's not a very technical <laughs> term. So, anyway. yeah, yeah. Uh, <laughs> Yeah. So, so um, you mentioned like the the philosophy of memory is fairly young, right? Mm -hmm. um, and you were, you know, ten years ago were one of the uh, first people really writing about it. it mm -hmm. Where where is it now? Is it is um, is it combative in the in amongst philosophers? Is it is everyone um, nice to each other? What what is the state yeah. of the philosophy yeah. of memory? Um, I think as a community itself, it's a great community of philosophers. So it's been. Maybe it's because I think it's brought together a lot of people, a, a lot of people doing philosophy of memory have come from kind of philosophy of mind and science in ways that they want memory to be the topic they're thinking about in that intersection. But there's people that have also come from other areas like epistemology and the history of philosophy and other places. So I think maybe they've always felt like outsiders because they were talking about a topic. So it's like we've created a community of people who everyone else was like, why do you care about this? And now we're all hanging out together, right. caring about the same <laughs> stuff. So in those ways, it's been a really, um, it's a very supportive community. And I think because, yeah, it, it's newer. And those of us who have, have been involved in starting it are just happy that it exists. Um, we've been, you know, <laughs> not eager to kick anyone out who wants to genuinely contribute. So um, <laughs> it's still a bit of an issue, uh, convincing some people who are uh, you know, more traditional about philosophy that, that that it is an area that it's kind of an inherently interesting set of topics. But um, but philosophers have talked about memory for a long time. Those puzzles have have you know been there. Right. Um, it's just kind of giving them a more proper focus. And how, how did you come on to be interested in memory and the philosophy thereof? Yeah, I mean, for me, I mean, it was always interesting, but there wasn't a literature. It was really actually my advisor um, in grad school, uh, Carl Craver, who's a philosopher mm -hmm. of neuroscience. Um, I was at that stage of dissertation writing where you're very much spinning your wheels, um, at least in philosophy, that kind of how you're trying to put together this big project. <laughs> and um, I really wanted to talk about different levels of explanation between psychology and philosophy and neuroscience. I had these, and it was just, it was... I can see now from the other side of it, it was just way too big of a project. Um, mm. And it was just out of control. And he was like, well, you know, why don't you just answer this question about like, let's just focus it a little bit, like take a memory trace. Is that a, a personal or a subpersonal phenomenon? So that was the kind of way I was framing things in terms of that distinction between levels. And he was like, you know, go and answer that question. And he was leaving, as I remember it, he was leaving for like a semester in Germany or something. And um, when he came back, I was like, well, you know, I was supposed to be finishing an entire draft of the dissertation while he was gone. And I was like, well, good news, bad news. Like, I didn't finish the whole thing. I'm only done with chapter one, the one about the memory trace thing. But now it's like 100 pages long. <laughs> and he was oh, like, God. I think actually you just changed your dissertation. I think you're writing about that. Wow. Um, so that was sort of 
um, yeah, kind of getting into the top, like realizing like, oh, there's things to say here. And, you know, there are, there's a lot of memory psychology at, I was at WashU in St. Louis. Um, and so Roddy Rodiger and Kathleen McDermott and um, a, a bunch of people working is, uh, on plenty of other memory <laughs> researchers as well, whose names I'm suddenly just completely blanking on. But, um, you know, there was a lot of memory in the air. So as soon as I kind of focused in on that and had taken classes with these people and, you know, been in conversations with them for several years, it was, you know, sort of clearer to see how you might come to focus on that as a, as a project mm. in and of itself. So that, that, that seems yeah. like a really cool PhD program. Um, what is it like the, what is it? What's the name of it? But it seems very interdisciplinary <laughs> and uh, yes, seems like a great it's place philosophy. to be. philosophy. Yeah, philosophy, neuroscience, and psychology. So PNP. Okay. Um, it's a great. Uh, yeah, th there's a range of things like it in philosophy. I, I mean, obviously have particular loyalties and affinities to that one, but it's a really fantastic um, way of doing that kind of the kind of work I've always wanted to do. So, should I have Carl on the podcast? You should. He is a um, it, good luck getting him to sit still for an hour. But um, yeah, he's okay. uh, he's okay. fantastic. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Okay. So um, you, you mentioned memory traces, and I guess that was what where your dissertation um, took you. But you've since written about like tons of different uh, topics in the philosophy of memory. So, and I could ask about any one, but I'm curious what you're excited about right now. Is there a specific thing that you're working on that uh, you're thinking about all the time that um, maybe we could start with with that? Yeah. Um, so I'm actually, I'm, I'm writing a book about memory traces <laughs> at the moment. That's what I'm sort of uh, in the throes of working and writing about. And and in some ways, connections between that and some of the work that you've talked with people on here previously about about the concept of the engram and and what sort of contemporary research about that sort of how those two things relate to one another. Um, you prefer saying memory traces to to engram, right? Uh, I do overall, um, but I think some of that I think they're very related notions. I think they do get used interchangeably. Mm. Um, there's reasons to keep them separate for commitments that might come on the engram side that you could have a trace view without having that engram some of the commitments that an engram brings along with that what can you can you spell that out for me a little bit i thought they were equivalent yeah yeah so i guess i mean so certainly the memory trace idea is an older idea right so it's you know you find versions of appeals to things uh to memory traces in aristotle you find rejections of it and other views around, of um of those kinds of times and appeals to it kind of throughout the history of, well, you know, philosophy, but when philosophy was, you know, where were the distinction between philosophy and psychology and the kind of natural philosophy of the world wouldn't have been distinguished. Mm. Um, so it's an older, it's a certainly, I think of it as something that people have long talked about when they've talked about memory, but it's never been very precise. I think for, for an idea that's had so much staying power, no one sat down and said, here's kind of like, it's it, the essence of what it is. So it's part of why I'm trying to write a book it's to put something out there like, here's what I think, you know, we should say it is. And I think without that, the engram is a kind of way of making that idea much more concrete. And so, of course, they're very, you might think of it as a, as a kind of proper subset of that memory trace idea that commits you to the idea that it's a physical brain mechanism. Oh, Maybe okay. it's about cer carrying certain kinds of information. So right, you could have been a philosopher of a different era and thought that minds and bodies were distinct in some kind of way, maybe you would have thought about the memory trace in a way that wasn't necessarily in the brain <laughs> or wasn't even necessarily a kind okay. of physical thing. Okay. Um, so it's more, the engram is more the implementation of the memory trace, like a physical yeah, implementation. It, okay. Yeah, it's kind of a, I sometimes, I mean, I've said sometimes, and I think is still what I think that it's a kind of scientized version of a memory, you know, it's kind of that concept <laughs> taken into that, you know, into the kind of contemporary space of neuroscience and biology. How, how's the book coming along? When is it going to be available? <laughs> um, I mean, in some sense, I've been working <laughs> on it for a long time. Um, it's I'm committed to sharing drafts of chapters with um, some colleagues for like a workshop these sessions starting in a couple of months. So um, that should, uh, so it will be shareable with a trustable small set in a couple months and then hopefully uh, more people, a, a broader audience, not too long after that. So, so um, four or five years, 
No, I'm just. Yeah, exactly. I mean, guy. Yeah, I, I. Part of me wants to say, like, of course not, but given <laughs> you know the math of how these things work, maybe that's true. <laughs> yeah. Um, so okay, yeah. well, let's talk about memory traces because it's you know, like you sort of alluded to, a trace is kind of a vague <laughs> notion or term also, and I, I guess that's why Ingram scientized it, uh, as you say. Mm-hmm. What are some alternatives to the idea of a memory trace, like how memory could work? Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, so I think part of the trick in answering that question is first thinking a little bit more about what a memory trace is. Because I think without one of the things I find kind of frustrating in that kind of dialectic to begin with is that the kind of thing you hear people frequently say nowadays in philosophy, but also in psychology and neuroscience is like, well, we know that memory is not a perfect recording of, you know, of one's experience. Or we, you know, they might start by saying like, we know that memories are not perfectly archived in a you know, library in the mind or something like that. And so you get a kind of straw man as a philosopher, you know, kind of straw person articulation of what the idea is a very like caricature of the idea. Like, of course, there's not... Hmm literal pictures stored in one's head of past experiences. So clearly that view is doesn't work. But then like what the alternative is, um, is not always well specified. So um, so one first thing is to say, like, there might be some ways of articulating what this commitment is that are somewhat less cartoonish than thinking that it's an argument for a video recording or a perfect image in one's head. Um, and so that's sort of part of the goal is to give a more substantive idea of what that that idea might be. Um, and also for philosophers who've written about these kinds of things, you either get the people who say like, you know, this sort of record archived recording idea is misleading, um, or you get people who say like, well, sure, I still feel, you know, of course there are still traces, but they're distributed, they're not local. Or they say, of course there's still traces, but they're, um, they don't have content to them. Or of course there's traces, but um, they're, uh, dispositional, not sort of, they're not, they don't, they're not explicitly represented or something. And those are all interesting alternatives, but they're really different from one another. And you might think like, if you, are there some features that if you got rid of them, it just wouldn't be a trace anymore? Like we have to, I think it's interesting to sort of have an idea of what the kind of concept is such that we sort of know when you've moved beyond it or not. So you know, I have a kind of collection of different things philosophers have said. And so it seems like you could have a trace view, but it could be radically, you know, very, very different from something that is also a trace view in terms of which things it supports or doesn't. Um, so what's what's as, your trace view? Yeah. Yeah. So as I think about it, I think the most profitable way of thinking about it is that traces are the kinds of things uh, that it, it's an entity that's the, the explanatory role that it plays, like the, the function of them, why we think that they exist, why we go looking for them, um, is that we think is in order to explain how we retain specific events or particular past experiences, that the trace is really there to explain a particular kind of retention, right? The way when I remember, uh, you know, and some very specific occurrence um, or something that's only happened one time. Um, So it's about a a way of retaining information that might exist alongside keeping track of general tendencies and trends and broader bits of information, but it's, it's about that kind of a commitment. So if that's the right way to think about it, then non-trace views are views that try to explain the entirety of memory or the entirety of cognition Mm -hmm. without thinking you're going to have those discrete, you know, whether you want to think that they're representations or not, but discrete mental brain states that hold individual events. But but a trace is not confined to episodic memory, right? I mean, it can be implicit memory, non-declarative, or, or what is the reach of a trace in the ontology of <laughs> yeah, the taxonomy so... of memory? <laughs> It's a great question. I mean, so the taxonomy you had sent me that you might ask about taxonomies of memory, and I think that they're kind of a mess in that way. And so I think that oh. I think of the idea of specific events or specific, you know, uh, individual experiences or, you know, pieces of information learning or something like that as being the kinds of things that could serve traces and that might cross cut classification. So, you know, so you might have, um, I mean, depending on how richly you define episodic memory, there are lots mm. of things that we do or encounter only one time that don't meet that criteria because they don't have the kind of 
phenomenological, the kind of mental time travel aspects to them. I mean, if you're me, I have like, I think eight or nine memories that meet that <laughs> more elaborate <laughs> requirement that Tolving wants. Um, but a lot of memories are, you know, the information I only acquired, you know, it was just one time that that thing happened um, or one time where I heard that. And like, I've forgotten a lot of the details, but I, I remember that thing and that that's what I, where I learned it or something like that. Um, and so that could hold true for some forms of implicit memory as well, some kinds of associations. Um, so that kind of, yeah, discrete one shot learning um, episodes. Kind of, so it's, it's a way of saying that's where the notion has its most proper use is in thinking mm. about retaining information in that way. So episodes would certainly be a central feature of it, but maybe not in the rich sense that how we've thought about episodic memories. But, so you think that the uh, that our taxonomy of memory is a hot mess? <laughs> <laughs> I do. I, I do think that's a technical term, hot mess. Um, and yes, it is very much a. <laughs> it's a hot mess. Um, yeah, it's a. It's. I mean, I was just thinking a few weeks ago about the fact that you know this kind of standard model that everyone uses. You know, we just dist we distinguish between declarative and non declarative. That we use these terms declarative and non declarative for that, which. I went trying to track down, like, where is the first paper that calls it declarative? That's such a strange, mm. you know, like, especially because now we study what we think are declarative memories in lots of animals where there's no declaring happening. Right. Um, and so, and it does look like it's maybe uh, the kind of holdover of the early cognitive revolution days in psychology and a lot of list and word learning paradigms is where people oh. first start talking about it. I, I don't know that I've, I haven't found anything where I could say, oh, that's the first mm. use, but that's where you start seeing oh, it in papers on. Yeah. <laughs> and it does have this kind of behavioral, behaviorist tinge of, you know, like if you're thinking about the memories, but in terms of like the expression that you see, um, where you see them. Um, and yeah, kind of how, I mean, episodic memory has been thought about over time is complicated. And the whole implicit side of the story is just, you know, everything that's over there, those things are just sort of thrown over there and ignored, I think, um, by a lot of people oh. doing memory work. And uh, yeah. What do we need, though? Do we need um, more categories? Do we need a finer grained taxonomy? Or do they, do we need to lessen the individual individuality of the categories because there's um blurry lines between them do, do you know what we need <laughs> yeah it's a it's a great question i mean i feel like half of the work or a lot of the work about memory taxonomies in particular was really coming about at a time when there was great optimism about taking our psychological categories that you know the cognitive psychology had done a really good job of making precise and imaging was starting up and we were like we we're just trying to line everything up right and so the kind of memory systems yeah. view and let's find the cog the neurocognitive systems that support that i think of it as like really bound up in that optimism that as i see it has come sort of crashing down more broadly huh. all of the kind of worries about cognitive ontology and and, you know, the ways that there might be, you know, massive neural reuse across systems and how we think about those functions. I think it, a, there's that worry kind of in the background of that sort of project. Um, but I, but more broadly, I think, you know, that we could have many ta taxonomies for different purposes. Um, so we could have one that says, let's pay attention to the, the brain regions that are most centrally involved or, the, you know, the kind of, it, and that might give us one way of saying like, well, these are, you know, maybe all of these are a similar kind of operation, even if they're not, but they're on massively different kinds of content, right? Or, okay, maybe there's ones that, you know, have content features in common, or maybe there's ones that come from particular species or others. Um, but the current way of sorting things out does leave out a lot of things, right? It leaves out a lot of, there aren't obvious places in which to put lots of kinds of memory that from everyday life seem like they're important. Like, um, I mean, the, and I'm going to say this and then I'm going to find out there's a whole literature in one of these areas I just don't know <laughs> yeah, about. But, always. Right. I mean, you know, like, <laughs> you know, like memory for like the sort of standard story about episodic memory is memory of episodes and then semantic memory is understood as like memory for facts or kind of generalizations. But it's not clear that that has a way of understanding like the way that we have memories for like people and places and things that we know well that I might have you know, like a, a sort of memory of that person, which is over time, just, you know, I've abstracted 
from all individual. You know, maybe I remember, of course, I remember some experiences, but I also just remember, I remember that car, I remember my first car, right? Mm. Like, maybe I don't remember any particular experiences about where I drove it, you know, I, I can think about that, right, as a thing yeah. in particular, separate from all that stuff. And like, well, where does that fit in the taxonomy? Um, right. Or, and that's just sort of one example of the moment, but yeah, lots of those kinds of things don't have neat spaces to go, but you might think, when you're asking people about those, their memories, those are the kinds of things people go to rather centrally. Um, mm. So, yeah, we don't know. There could to, be other. Yeah. It doesn't fit cleanly in the <laughs> in the taxonomy. It's like it's an abstraction. <laughs> it's kind of semantic, but you know, in, with, with the car example, because it's um, it is factual, but it's also autobiographical. Yeah, I'd have to think about that more. Yeah, and it's got all this, it's got imagery, it's got, you know, it's got all this stuff to it. Um, but yeah. like zooming out though, like um, <laughs> you were talking about the the worry about cognitive ontologies. W what's your view on that? Or <laughs> how have your how have your thoughts been shaped over time um regarding the neuroscience to psychology divide or connection or lack thereof? Yeah. Um, yeah, I guess uh, like I, I mean, I've always been a little hesitant about some of the connections. I mean, this comes up in some of my work more directly, but I mean, I do think there are questions about levels of explanation, sort of how they fit onto and map to one another. So in the, I mean, when I was in graduate school and taking at WashU had a standard kind of methods in fMRI course that all the grad students that were in the kind of psych neurospace took and the students in my program took as well. And it was a team taught course by, you know, the whole slew of people at, at WashU who did the different stages and phases of all the things that go into fMRI, which was hmm. absolutely fascinating to do. And, it, you know, there was, and that was a good place to be doing it, a lot of optimism about this kind of like, we've got these really well de defined kind of cognitive phenomena and effects and functions. And we're getting better and better at the kind of task design to do in a scanner with the right kinds of analyses. And we're lining these things up. And and I remember even at the time being a little frustrated and thinking like, well, so suppose my psycho psychological theory says that these are two distinct processes. And you come back to me and you tell me it happens in one brain area. That doesn't obviously tell me that that's wrong, right? It might tell me that brain area is doing two functions, right? It might, um, that it's doing two things or, you know, and the reverse could be true. You could have one function and I could find out it's in three or four locations that it's happening. That like, of course there are ways that these things constrain each other, but in terms of like which direction the inference goes, like, are we using what we know about these functions to figure out what the brain is doing? Are we using it as a, like a referendum on psychology? Um, I was sort of worried about those questions from the beginning and people, would, my colleagues who were, you know, my grad student friends who were in psychology and neuroscience would often roll their eyes like the philosopher is always making this so complicated. Uh -huh. um, <laughs> um, but I mean, you know, they took me seriously, but that wasn't their concern. And I feel like the field more generally from the scientist's point of view for, for their own reasons and motivations, obviously, is kind of in a similar space now, those kind of those worries were more peripheral um, ten or fifteen years ago than they are than they are now, um, yeah. and I don't have yeah I don't know that I have uh, yeah well worked out like views about how it's going to go. I worry about a kind of I mean. I worry about what a bottom-up ontology looks like. I think some people have been, you know, like, let the brain tell its own story about what the categories are. Like, I think that might end up being one way to do it. But our ways of examining that have always been guided by what we think the functions are that we're looking right. for and how we understand those phenomena. So I'm not I'm not sure we'd even know how to interpret that were we to get it. Um, yeah, and we have to use words eventually anyway. So... Um... <laughs> Exactly. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, yeah. So you were talking about, you know, the same brain area, maybe having two different functions. And um, you've written about imagination versus memory because um, people have an account. So I want to come back to that. But I but I, I'm jumping the gun a little bit because uh, I want to talk about traces a little bit more because you you focus so much sure. uh, of that in your work. Is optogenetics a like revolution in the idea of studying traces? 
I, I think that it is. I mean, that's the only as someone, you know, I took the classes I had to take at, in doing the kind of neurobiology, cell biology stuff, but that was never my focus. I was much more interested in the psychology and the cognitive neuroscience um, side of things. And, you know, so the mere fact that I've learned a lot about and now write about optogenetics is in its own way a kind of testimony to me of like, okay, you know, I started reading these papers and thought like, uh oh, I have to go learn this stuff. I have to, because it's, yeah, it's, yeah, it's, it's changing, I think, uh, lots of things about how we think about those things. So I'm, I'm very excited about it in general, um, uh, as a research program, but also as kind of a stage, um, of, of asking questions about memory. How has it affected the, the philosophy of memory? I mean, has it settled questions? Is it opening up new cans of worms? Yeah, I mean, so for the philosophy of memory, you know, as we were talking about earlier, is a pretty new area. And unlike other parts of these sort of ways we think about the mind that philosophy has been talking about for a while, those have been, other areas have been more hooked up to the science all for a while now. You know, there's been a lot of work at the intersection of philosophy and psychology and neuroscience. So memory, because it hadn't been, had a lot of catching up to do, right? So philosophers, the traditional philosophical conception of, of memory is like it is for a lot, you know, that memories are these things that are stored in your head and they're, you pull them out when you need them and you, you know, hit play and there they go. Um, and, you know, philosophers have used appeals to that kind of thing to explain everything from knowledge to personal identity, moral responsibility, right? I mean, memory is an important thing. And so you have this kind of, strong notion of it. So once you have people doing philosophy of memory, it becomes a real concern that like, uh oh, this is another place where the technical term hot mess applies. Well, I think like, <laughs> turns out memory is a hot mess. Like, you know, you think you're remembering and you're not. So all of the false memory literature showing, you know, that we can be sort of memory can be systematically manipulated and distorted in ways you can't detect um, from the first person perspective. That really, like, so I guess, like, philosophy of memory, if, if it started by saying, like, let's pay attention to the science of memory, that's where it had to go. That's where everyone went first, myself included. Like, uh oh, we got to say something about about that. Um, so maybe memory isn't what people have always thought that it was. Maybe we should think about it differently. You asked about the optogenetics role. So I guess in that sense, because everything was so dominated by the false memory literature and the study of it in psychology and neuroscience, most of the science to which philosophers of memory have paid attention has been at that level. So oh. optogenetics, part of its kind of basic significance is giving a really strong argument for paying attention to cellular or molecular level studies of memory, which, you know, of which there are, of course, decades, if not, you know, at this point, more than a century of work. Uh, so that's a huge, huge place, piece. But the, has optogenetics settled whether there are memory traces, whether there is an engram? I mean, I know I had Tom, Tomas Ryan on, and I, I think that he would reply that yes, it has, but he's a pro-engram researcher. Right? <laughs> um, yeah, I'm a huge fan of, of his work and the work in that area. Um, so I think it certainly has, it's definitely, it, I mean, to my mind, yes, it's settled that question. There are There are traces. I think where the people who don't share my trace enthusiasm <laughs> would would speak up is that it doesn't, you know, maybe it's only for these very low level memories. Maybe it's, you know, like you're showing them in these cases, you, you haven't really, you know, obviously we're a long ways from human episodic memories of someone's seventh birthday or something like that. Yeah. Um, and you can grant that, but still think like this is a major step um, in that direction. One of the things that you write about um, are arguments against there being memory traces is uh, people who are in favor of a neural dynamics account uh, of memory. Could you just exp um, explain what that means and then why you argue that uh, neural dynamics does that not actually pose a threat to the idea of mm -hmm. traces? Yeah, so I guess... Um... Part of why I think it, I guess it, de it depends on exactly how the, the claim of neural dynamics gets made. Um, and I think on certain ways of making that claim and for certain kinds of trace views, it could cause a problem. So mm. especially if you have something like that sort of straw man conception of like memory traces just are these um, 
you know, video recordings in the head, right? If you sort of prove like the brain can't hold, the brain can't do that. Right? There's no such thing that could play that role. Then that would be, those kinds of views could be deeply challenged by, by neural dynamics. But more broadly, from another side, like the sort of, I think it's important to articulate exactly what the worry is about what neural dynamics is for memory. Because finding out and paying attention to all of the dynamical features of neural activity doesn't change the fact that this is, it feels very similar to the like two psychological processes, one brain region kind of worry, right? Like lots of things we do might be deeply dynamic and yet um, right, at the experience level, it doesn't feel that way, right? So the brain is mm. massively dynamic you know, and maybe even perception too is a hot mess, but it feels to me like I'm looking at a constant world in front of me. Right? <laughs> um, I'm going to see how many times I can use that. <laughs> I love it. Yeah. Before we're done. <laughs> um, right. But so like it doesn't, you know, the dynamic, the dynamicity of the brain isn't, isn't like uh, things can still be stable and feel stable and have a constancy to them in the midst of that at, at a separate level. Um, so it's, you know, I think that is a kind of background thing also to keep in mind. Another point that, I always think about when people are worried about neural dynamics for traces is that one of the views that's been, I mean, people make trouble for it nowadays, but a prominent thing that people have thought about memory in the brain for a long time involves systems consolidation and the idea that memory traces over time move from the hippocampus to prefrontal cortex. And they're like, that, I mean, if you're fine with a trace like picking up and moving and being housed by entirely different neurons, um, and that's a view of people, have, you know, obviously there are alternative views too, but lots of people have taken that idea seriously. Then you think that there is, there's already built into the field some idea that like the same thing Right, that information can migrate to a new place and yet be a persistent version of this kind of thing. So if that idea is there, then there are ways of thinking about persistence or continue, you know, continuity of information that allow for those kinds of dynamics. It is a challenge. You can't, you know, maybe certain kinds of mechanisms aren't compatible with what we learn about certain features of neural dynamics. Um, but you know, so whatever you say is, uh, you know, are the mechanisms by which information persists, they better be, you know, resistant or uh, sort of resilient in the face of those kinds of things. But then you're talking about information, and that's not a physical thing, right? So, okay, you have a memory in the hippocampus, it gets consolidated in the cortex. And those are kind of t <laughs> two different traces, I guess you would say, but two, mm -hmm. two different implementations of the same trace because the trace is information. Ha set me straight on this. <laughs> Good. So I think that the trace, of the, I mean, clearly it has a physical, we think of it as a physical mechanism. I think that's a, it's an inescapable feature. But part of how we identify and find that physical neural mechanism is by its informational sensitivity, right? I mean, that's like... Over time, you can tell the kind of story of getting to the engram that that Ryan and, and Jocelyn and others have have found their way to as a story of getting more and more precise tools to say, like, you know, the, this is these are the cells involved because these are the ones that play the most information sensitive role. Right. So the way that you tell, like, is this a is this an engram relevant cell or not, or is this an engram relevant process or not, is the role it plays in encoding and retaining that information. So it's a we're certainly looking for a mechanism, but it's a mechanism that carries that information in the right way. So that both features are, are there from the beginning. Um, and you might think like it's a requirement that it have a physical mechanism, but the physical mechanism can change over time, right? It might, it, like maybe it migrates from one neuron to the other. <laughs> maybe it Maybe it moves or maybe it just, you know, updates the way it's held over time or parts of it degrade in ways that may in some ways relate to that information and not. I think these are actual puzzles we have to think about, about how we think carrying that information relates to what that mechanism is. Um, so yeah, they're going to, and I think this is the real puzzle and it's part of what optogenetics and the suite of tools around it really let us do for the first time. It's like not just watch these things, get formed or watch these things when memories are being reactivated, but kind of track them over time, right? We can, mm. we can now image them, we can mess with them when we want to. Um, I say we, I'm not doing this, they're doing this. Um, but that lets you kind of keep an eye on these states over time, right? And 
from a philosopher's perspective, that lets you ask a lot of questions about like, well, how do you know you're finding the same thing, right? Mm -hmm. One is by finding, re-identifying that very same mechanism, right? The neurons that you've stained um, and seeing what happens with them. But another way is whether or not you're eliciting the same behavior or representation that you think is involved. Mm -hmm. Um, And I think it's going to be an open and very difficult question what starts to happen as we notice that, well, the underlying physical mechanism, we're, if, we, if we're following it and its changes, it might take us here, right? It might be, you know, but if we follow the information sensitivity, it could take us in a different direction. And sort of how are we going to think about which one really matters? Um, I don't have a good answer to that question, but I'm a philosopher. My job is to pose really tricky questions. <laughs> <And> so <laughs> I'm going to try to pose that question very well and then let the smart people with the tools figure it out. Here's a tricky question perhaps you can settle. What, <laughs> what is the boundary of a memory? I guess that you could ask that of any representation in the brain, but you know, thinking about a trace and the, you know, let's say you have 50 cells, right, that are instantiate this memory trace mm-hmm. or something. Like is is that is there a clear way to think about the boundaries of a memory? Yeah, it's a great I mean <laughs> I'm not sure. Um, what it excites me about optogenetics and some of the around, surrounding stuff is that I think maybe for the first time, we can really pose that question and worry about it, mm. right? So, you know, previously, lots of work about the kind of basic mechanisms of different kinds of memory, which you know involved a kind of implicit commitment to like, this particular memory is some of these particular cells. But for the first time, really, we have like, now we can actually show you that we can literally count the cells and then we can reactivate it and we can recount them and we can see as those studies find like there's very strong overlap but it's not precise mm-hmm. um and i mean i don't know so i don't know what will happen as that gets there's going to be a burden i think not just at the mechanism level but at the content level for how we think about that like so what do you think the content of that memory is um and you know what might happen is that we start to explore like what would it mean for some of that content to go away or what that content to change Mm -hmm. and how does that relate to the underlying changes that we're seeing and we might come up with like accounts that better and worse fit that data um you know it makes sense of that kind of story of what it is that we see so yeah i think I mean, part of why I was so excited about optogenetics to begin with is it it has that kind of precision that a philosopher wants for these kind, you know, like, oh my gosh, you can literally see exactly that, you know, you can count the neurons involved here. Um, But of course, once you can do that, you realize like, well, it's not exactly the ones that we thought we were recruiting or Mm. which ones reactivate or how strongly they reactivate does vary over time. Um, So of course, it's more complicated than that. So, but for the moment, I'm just mess. focused on the kind of it's it's a hot mess. Yeah. Um, you know, it's exciting that we can do it. Um, like it's great that we actually get to be worried about that problem, which is in a way a new problem. I've, I've lately I've been enamored with process philosophy. I don't know how mm-hmm. familiar you are with um, process philosophical uh, philosophical accounts of you know various things, but um, I, I in preparation for uh, talking with you, I looked up in um, Dan Nicholson's book, Everything Flows, to see if there was a chapter on the process philosophy of memory. And uh, I, I didn't find anything. I didn't do an exhaustive search, but hmm. this, you know, approaching it from a process philosophy standpoint, um, I have not thought clearly about this, but, you know, just marrying that idea with the idea of a memory trace, which seems like a, a much more stable thing. And then thinking about the the neural dynamics account of how everything is constantly um, mm-hmm. being... Um, uh, you know, remade, rebuilt, change everything is constant, constantly in flux, right? So I, I don't know if you've thought about that, but um, I thought I'd just ask you if you had. Yeah, so I don't know the process stuff. Um, super, I, d- I don't know it well enough mm. to say much of anything, except that I think for a lot of these um, kind of radical shifting views about cognition and and the mind, um, it feels like memory is often a sticking point. <laughs> so I know for like a lot of predictive processing views or a lot of kind of massive simulation style views, a lot of views that are, which, yeah, again, I don't know the processing stuff as well, but a lot of them come from offloading things onto the environment or operating from very strong kind of general rules you can use 
you know, kind of in uh, across a wide, wide range of things. And memory, yeah, it does. It is a kind of sticking point for a lot of these things because it's it's offline. It's it's more static or constant. Um, sort of why and when it pops out, <laughs> what good it's doing us sometimes. Uh, all of that is um, is less clear. And so it is. I mean, yeah, it feels like if I wanted to spend my time just picking on other people and other views, I could spend <laughs> um, <laughs> I could spend time just making trouble for like putting memory into some of those frameworks. Hmm. Uh, maybe, you know, uh, maybe we can switch gears and talk about the relationship between memory and imagination. Um, I don't know. I, I don't know if it's Daniel Schachter who started yeah. this, this constructionist view of memory and kind of equating it with imagination. And I know that you've participated in some debates on this and you've written about it. So are memory and imagination the same thing? And and what the hell is imagination anyway? <laughs> great question. Um, so no, and then great question. Um, and I'll find a way to use hot mess again by saying that like, <laughs> I, I don't, I think, so the philosophy of imagination has been an area in philosophy for a lot longer than memory. Um but I think our understanding of what imagination is or the many different purposes to which it could be put has is sort of all over the place. And I so already I think those ways they're not well suited categories for one another. Um, I think there are big overlaps between memory and imagination um, in the ways that like for a lot of imaginative activity, if you think of part of what it is doing is generating imagery or creating, you know, like in a kind of what I think of as a default sense of what I mean when I say imagination is like, I imagine like my six-year-old does, right? I'm imagining this kind of superhero I want to put together that has like, you know, different animal features and has different kinds of superpowers. And it's something I've never seen before, but it's built out of elements that I've derived from experience in lots mm -hmm. of different ways, right? That's part of what, and if, on that kind of view, which I think is my sort of, you know, background view that I come in with, like, well, memory and imagination are related because memory is like the raw content that imagination uses. It's kind of using the things, you know, like I take what I remember about like what different animals can do and look like. And I, but I put it together in ways I've never seen to create a, you know, mythical superhero um, of some kind. Yeah, this is so um, I guess part of the debate here is that uh, at least in fMRI, it seems that memory and imagination are uh, constituted by highly overlapping brain areas, at least as measured by mm -hmm. um, oxygenation levels in the brain, which, you know, <laughs> right. is not necessarily like even if you had the exact same area, uh, the resolution with which you can measure activity in the brain using fMRI, I, I don't know that it would be able to tell you anything conclusive about how it was happening and whether it was exactly the same neurons and brain areas, you know? Exactly. And I think for the, you might think that the same brain areas would be activated even if the story that I was telling was true versus the stronger story that they're the same, right? Because if I'm making use of the content of my memory to do the imagining, then it would be, in fact, like... In reading some of those studies, part of my sort of background, my knee-jerk reaction has always been like, like it would have been alarming if we hadn't found that, if that result hadn't been found, right? Like if you, <laughs> especially given, the, especially given the methodology of those studies, which you know for reasons that are necessary for doing fMRI work, they're highly similar. You know, they're asking people to generate imaginative scenarios that they've well matched to actual memories. Um, that's going to, you know, that's going to, even if these two capacities are more separated, that's going to push them as close together as possible. Mm. Um, so, uh, so I have some skeptical, you know, sort of skepticism about how much you can infer on the basis of those studies, but also the kind of broader background motivation for those studies. So I think what's led people to um, articulate this view of, of this close relationship between memory and imagination is in part because of this perceived need to give a different account of what memory is because of all of the false memory work. So yeah. that has made people really concerned, like, well, the, the function of memory can't be for remembering because, you know, I like if, if it were, I wouldn't be so bad at it. <laughs> and so what is what is memory doing? And so finding its overlap with imagination and thinking about it in those ways, I think is a kind of is thought of as a way to save that project. And 
for me, I've kind of gotten off the boat <laughs> sort of long before we get to the actual studies and mm. thinking that that was necessary. I mean, um, I, so the, the the constructivist view, which you adhere to, right? In some ways, yeah. <laughs> oh, okay. Well, <laughs> yeah. tease that apart for me. So, what maybe uh, can you just say what the constructivist uh, view is, and then and then what you agree? What, you're a philosopher. You're going to be very nitpicky here. So that's, <laughs> that's what a hot yeah. mess. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Exactly. I'll clean up the hot mess a little bit. I'll make a move to clean up the make hot mess. Move, yes. um, but I say, <laughs> um, I'll, like the the constructivist I mean, part of the constructivist claim is just that is this idea that memories are constructed at the time of retrieval, right? Or that there's some part of it is this rejection of an overly simplistic idea of retrieval is just the act of you know going and fetching the memory and you know. Re- hitting play or turning the light on um, this idea that, you know, lots of things can have an effect on how it is you remember a past event. So information you've learned since then, but also, you know, the way I ask you questions, the mood that you're in, probably your blood sugar, lots of things are going to affect, you know, how it is you actually represent or generate um, and produce that memory. So it is constructive in that sense. It's not a just, you know, sort of discrete extraction from from a memory store. And I, I'm fully in support of that. So it's wrong to think that memories are just, you know, that retrieval is kind of like a neutral window. I think it's actually Schachter or someone who articulates the view that way, um, that through which you can just directly probe memory. Um, but some people take the constructivist claim to be, um, that to mean that there's nothing, that, that it's entirely a process of constructing from, of course, from, from stored what? information, yeah. but <laughs> I mean, it has to come <laughs> exactly, from somewhere. From, yeah. Yeah. So that's where I think that that's part of what is the basis for having this idea about traces as being a particular way of thinking about what information retention is. Because, of course, more radical constructivists don't deny that you retain information from your past experiences, but they think that you do it in ways that are highly generalized or schematic or, you know, they're based on sort of overall patterns of information uh, and the kinds of things that you could learn in a more generalized way Hmm. rather than keeping track of particular pieces of information. Hmm. Um, So that's the kind of, that's the sort of difference. So they might think like you have a kind of broad network of, you know, like every experience I have in the world adds to my way of understanding the world, but it does so in this way that is, you know, maybe I've got a lot of, (laughs) I've got a lot of Bayesian things set up, so I'm I'm keeping track of what's likely and what's probable across the range of experiences that I have. And so if I have an experience that violates my expectations, that's going to change how I think about what the likelihoods are of the different features that were there co-occurring in, in different kinds of ways, right? And so you are going to store information, but just in ways that serve these general updating processes. So then having a memory is just going to be a matter or, you know, remembering something is just going to be applying those sorts of predictive processes backwards. Mm. Um, And so I, I build something, I mean, not out of nothing, but not on the basis of some stored information about that event. Is it uh, accepted these days um, that when you retrieve a memory, um, by the act of retrieving it, whether you're constructing it anew or from, you know, some some register, that uh, it necessarily changes the reconstruction account of um, memory? I think so. I think that aspect of retrieval is largely accepted. I mean, there are still some views in philosophy that try for some, at least, you know, they they want some ideas of like, in really pure conditions, <laughs> you could have, you know, kind of pure remembering. Um <laughs> So, so I think you might still get some people who want those kinds of things. Um, but I think as a broader, people are much more sensitive to that, the, the ways in which like subsequent information and experience and like what's happening with you now changes the, the nature of that memory. Yeah. You don't think that memory is for the future. Um, I, I kind of do. I, I think that memory, you know, talking about the function of memory, what is it for? Mm-hmm. How could it not be about your ongoing and future behavior? Yeah, I mean, I'm probably going to live to regret 
letting them punch up the title of that in, the, in the you know what way. is the title memory um, is not for the future i believe is the actual something title like that, that. Yeah. i think it's yeah yeah so it's you know philosophers need at least seven people to read the things that they write down so that's one way to maybe maybe i'll get eight out of that um no so in some sense, I agreed too. Um, but what I what I haven't agreed with is the way that that kind of claim is built into how people think about how that claim is often understood um, for thinking about this sort of constructive approach, right? Mm-hmm. So I do think that memory is for the future, and that like the, the organism is only keeping stuff around in an individual case, but also um, if we're thinking about it evolutionary evolutionarily in terms of like things that are either good for it or at least not too costly (laughs) such that they die out, right? So at some point it has to pass that kind of threshold and that has a forward looking feature to it. Um, So memory had to get by in that sort of, it had to get by in that framework in one way or another. The part of it that I don't, the claim that episodic memory is for the future from some people like Schachter and colleagues who have this sort of strong link between memory and imagination and constructivism view is that they think that that means that if it's for the future, then it's not going to retain information from particular past events, right? It, that's not what the function, it's the system isn't doing that. Instead, the system is keeping track of lots of information in these more generalized and schematic ways, and then performing lots of simulations about what I, you know, about what's happening now, what's happening, what could happen tomorrow, and when needed about what happened yesterday, Hmm. right? Um, And the sort of thought is like, because it's for the future, it doesn't keep track of particular events. Um, And I think, so I'm perfectly happy with saying it's for the future if that has an influence on how we keep track of information from past events, but that's not, that doesn't preclude saying that there are traces. Um, Hmm. In fact, I think your simulations are only gonna work so well, unless you actually do have something like that built into the view at some point. Hmm. Um, if you had, maybe this is not a coherent question, but uh, if you had to give up one personally, would you rather give up your memory or your imagination, you know, since they're not the same thing? Yeah, that's a good, um, <laughs> I would definitely rather give up my imagination. I think mine is rather impoverished to oh. begin with, probably. <laughs> um, I think... <laughs> I'm one of the, like, I was always the, like, I can't abide a time travel movie. I'm one of those people that are like, I'm noting the inconsistencies, oh. science fiction sometimes. Like, he can, you know, he's not falling through the floor, but he can walk through a wall. Like, someone explained that. Like, I'm... Oh, sci-fi so movies are I'm the often... worst. Yeah. <laughs> they are. Yeah, they so are. I, I can't I can't I, watch them either. Like, and yes, I can't enjoy good. them. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Yeah, exactly. I get so hung up on those things. I don't get lost in the stories in the way I'm supposed to. So imagination in that sense, I think I'm already <laughs> already deficient in. So, um, yeah. <laughs> That's not going to serve you well as a philosopher. Don't you need a good imagination as a philosopher? <laughs> oh, so, I mean, it, I think philosophy really takes lots of kinds of people. You've got to have the people with the imaginative big views and the other people that sit around and poke holes. And I think I'm I'm a, more of the that... <laughs> <laughs> that philosopher saying like the it doesn't work thing. i don't see how it works mm-hmm. huh. yeah interesting so here's another uh kind of random question so we've talked about errors in memory and there are different kinds of you know errors but could mm-hmm. misremembering things uh somehow be um an important feature of our intelligence or advantageous like what is there anything advantageous about misremembering I think there's a lot that's advantageous about misremembering, um, in part because you see, as a lot of the studies of it have shown, like with other kinds of memory deficits, um, things like um, Alzheimer's and other forms of dementia, you often lose those errors. Um, you like lose the sensitivity to some of the like the DRM effects, um, the like list the cases of things where, you know, if I give you a list of related words, um, so like you know pillow, blanket, alarm, tired, melatonin, I don't know. Um, and then, you know, ask you later about things that were on that list, you'd be much more likely to think that sleep was on that list, mm-hmm. right? So those kinds of effects, those um, diminish uh, with, mem- with like memory disorders. So it looks like there is some correlation between being susceptible to those kinds of things and having a memory that in some sense is working as it should, right? I mean, and, and it makes sense. I mean, it's, if, if you're, 
if your goal in life is to perform well in psychology experiments of list learning, then you're not doing very well. Right. But if your goal is to, you know, remember, like, you know, the, of the list of things on your grocery list, like, were you trying to make soup or were you trying to bake a cake? Like, that's going to help you in general. It's better to come home with like two additional soup ingredients if you think you're making soup, <laughs> even if it's not the exact ones you can probably make do. Um, Right. Like that serves you well. Um, you know, it's good if you're talking to me about something that I figure out the topic of what you're talking about and think about related things. That's a that's a good thing. Right. I draw connections between my experiences. That's a good thing. Um, so I do think those effects. Um, I, mean, I think it, so. Roddy Rodiger in a paper a long time ago, like talked about them in the same way that we talk about perceptual illusions and the kind of like fun house sort of things like the those experiments are really good for showing us, I think, more how our memory works than how it doesn't work. Right. In the sense of like, you don't go to the eye doctor after you've been through the house of mirrors because you think that something's wrong with your vision. You've just been in a situation that shows you right, that exploits those features. And if you think those experiments are well designed to, you know, test the kind of boundaries of your memory capacities. That's really what they're doing. Yeah, I wonder, one of the reasons why I ask is because, for instance, a computer uh, has quote unquote perfect memory because it's just, you know, a physical register, yeah. right? That you can then retrieve and it doesn't make mistakes. And, you know, often we on this podcast, we talk about features of, you know, human intelligence and or brains um, that may or may not be important for building yeah. artificial intelligence. And, and I don't know, I was going to ask you this earlier too. I don't know if the concept of computer memory has sort of affected the way that we think of our own memory and, and we, we think of in terms of, of that permanent sort of computer storage. And that's how we should think about our own memories. Uh, do you think that that's the case? Yeah, I do. I mean, I think, I think that it's gone in a certain way and maybe this is not entirely, sometimes I feel like I'm a bit of a Luddite about certain computer technology metaphors for, for memory and cognition. But I mean, I think a lot of the early computer designs are very much based on how we thought memory worked, right? And at the time, yeah. you know, it was a sort of sensible way of thinking about memory of yeah, having, right. you know, like, taking everything, giving it an address, <laughs> storing it, and then calling it up by that address. And then here we go. Um, and so it might have been built by what we thought was a very sensible way of thinking about it. And that kind of view of memory in some respect or another is sort of in the background of a lot of, you know, philosophical and theoretical works that people wrote at those times. And it's only, and then of course that as a technology and theory, the, the computer memory stuff has taken off on its, right. Those things have taken off for their own. That's turned out to be incredibly useful. I think useful in part because of how different it is from how we store information. Right? Mm. Like we put all the things there um, that it does so much better than that. Those things do so much better than we do. And since then, we've learned a lot about human memory that is really hard to square with that model. Um, so, you know, <laughs> I mean, for instance, the list effects that I was talking about a minute ago, the D the DRM, D. Sertiger McDermott kind of paradigm where you, think you remember the word sleep when you hear the list of related words like that's really hard to understand in the kind of computer model right. sense right like if i manage to get to the address <laughs> if i manage to get to the memory of that list and extract it which the, you know like it'd be strange that i get wrong what's there in the ways that i do um so those kinds of results are hard to fit into that model um and so it seems like there that's one i mean there's i think other disanalogies to for, from that perspective but you know parts of that still seem i mean there's still parts of those models that seem quite right and that as a tracy person it's hard not to give up on like there is kind of built into this this idea of like you keep track of things you know particular pieces of information and you put them in places and like it's hard for me not to think at, you know that the opto ingram stuff is showing like some forms of that are happening at some level for some pieces of you know some experiences and information um, but the overall organization, I think, has got to be has got to be at least a little bit different. Did you just call yourself a Tracy person? I, tra I think I did. Yeah. Okay. Someone okay. said to me not that long. <laughs> someone called it Team Trace not that long ago, and I was like, "Oh, I like that. I could make shirts." Um, so uh, yeah, so maybe <laughs> sure. that's better than Tracy. <laughs> but so you know, it just 
kind of perseverating on, on this idea a little bit. Would we want to build human-like memory in robots? I mean, don't we want perfect memory, artificial yeah. agents? Yeah, so you, I think you would want them to be, you're either going to want what is what we want out of a lot of our computing systems is that we want them to store a massive piece of information. When I ask for the thing that's at address 104, I mean the thing that's at address 104. I don't mean the thing that's, at, so, you know, like I'm going to be very particular about what I want and it's going to allow me to store massive amounts of stuff. Um, so so in that sense, yeah, we don't want those capacities. Um, yes. Yeah, so I think it, it does raise interesting questions about like whether there is a way for something to have the system we do and do it in like particular. So could you have a good version? You know, so for things right. we do have like episodic memory, like what would be the point or function of doing that? Um, so I have spent a little bit of time collaborating with a couple of computer scientists who've thought about that a little. You know, like There are plenty of people who've thought about it um, even more, but it's interesting to me to think about like, why would you, what's the, what could the goal be of that? Um, it seems like the only thing I've heard that seems like it could be close to being the right kind of thing is that if you were in situations where you were trying to build kind of robot or drone models of things where you're sending them to places that humans aren't going to go and you want yeah. them to report back to you, um, <laughs> that you might want them to have something like those capacities. Um, why? What, what, what? Even... Yeah, what would be yeah. the advantage of getting misinformation from your robot on Pluto? Good. So you'd want it to have a working version of that. You'd want it to get that kind of, you know, you'd want it to do episodic memory, but do like the ideal human version <laughs> that doesn't change or distort <laughs> over time. Um, and then that's a question of like, is that really human memory you're trying to build right. then? Or are you trying to build something like, you know, a one-off that's actually, you know, an upgrade? Is there any merit to the idea that um, that is perhaps a way that we are creative by making mistakes and then analyzing the mistakes and somehow, you know, when you join two things that are not alike or whatever, that's one form of creativity. But is is creativity related, do you think at all, to misremembering and, and, and memory errors? I do think it's related. And I think... Um, and th I think that's one of the early directions that Schechter and some of the people that now think about memory and imagination as, as being related, we're trying to go. So there are a couple of papers. I don't know if there's a reason that there's not more, but there are a few papers that show that on certain me ways of measuring creativity, you get increased susceptibility to like the DRM effect and other of these false memory effects. Those things are very well correlated to one another. Um, and yes, I mean, it wouldn't surprise me if there is some kind of relationship there that you're kind of you're putting together lots of different things, you know, if that's kind of what you're thinking about. That kind of does require you to sort of take apart <laughs> whatever memories you have of particular things or be willing to take them apart in certain ways. Is that what confabulation is also that you're uh, my mom is the worst confabulator, by the way. And I don't, I'm really worried about myself as I age, like, or how much I'm confabulating, you know, without knowledge of it. <laughs> yeah, it's, it's scary. I mean, it's scary how those things work. I mean, I think that's the, the way we sell ourselves on this is by saying like, actually, it's just a sign of how creative I am. Yeah. <laughs> this yeah. is just a terrible side effect. <laughs> um, but yeah, I think there's, I mean, <sighs> There are, I mean, and I also think that there are probably individual differences across those kinds of things, and it would maybe make sense that there would be, um, in terms of you know how much those things happen. So for confabulation, it's so tricky. So I think it can happen in a couple of different ways. I mean, the kinds of ways that confabulation, in the more clinical sense, where you have this happening in you know, in broader cases of mental disorder or dysfunction, right? Like in schizophrenia or something like that. Mm -hmm. Those might be slightly different, kind of like, you know, there might be ways that you're not doing a good job of yeah, thinking about how you generate <laughs> plausible representations of what you did the other day and, and weed them out. Um, but for other people, some of it is sort of, could be source monitoring kinds of effects. I mean, that's how you get some of the confab, like the Elizabeth Loftus style studies, right? I, you ask people lots of questions about something, ask them to imagine something. And then over time, right, mm -hmm. you think about this event later and you've thought about it so much that it now feels, it has the feeling of a real event. And so yeah. you sort of misinterpret it as such. And I think, you know, sometimes people tell you stories. I have one of these confabulation things of, 
my brother and I, when we were little, were on a, like a vacation, like boogie boarding in California. And I have this memory that I used to tell of like getting pulled out on a day when there were the sort of under, you know, the undercurrent and um, like getting sucked out and people having to come get me and it being very, very scary. And it turns out it happened to my brother. It took uh-huh. like years. For, I mean, we were, we were little, probably like six and eight at the time or something, maybe slightly younger. And so for years, I thought it happened to me. And it wasn't until, you know, it's not an event my family really talks about for you know, for any reason. And I had mentioned it and everyone was like, that was not you. <laughs> but did you brother. see it? Did you um, see it happen to your brother? Yeah, or I, I saw it. I was, yeah. I saw it. I was right there. I was huh. so worried, especially as the older sibling for not helping. And I think, I mean, my, mem- my memory theorist justification for that is like, I took it so seriously and I've probably freaked out and thought, what if that happened to me? Huh. Right. And over time, what stuck around was like a very first person image of what it was like for that to happen. Um, hmm. And it wasn't until I got to the point of like, well, do you remember people pulling you out? I'm like, well, no, I don't remember that part at all. Like, <laughs> I have no memory of that. I just have this like, yeah, um, parts of it seemed very vivid because they're ones that I thought about. And now you can't um, uh, not remember it that way, probably, right? You just can, you kind of, <laughs> uh, I was going to say imagine, but the, maybe, you know, you simulate the the thing that's in your mind and then you realize that it's not real. Is that the... Is that the phenomenon? Exactly. Yeah. yeah. So it's like it still has all the same stuff to it, but I just like I don't endorse it anymore in the same way. Uh, yeah. I my mom like will to my like I'll be in the room. This has happened so many times. I can't I can't count the number, and she'll make up a story <laughs> about something about me, and it's it is patently false, and she just does it like as if it's very real and without a hitch in her voice. I. It drives me nuts. I love you, mom, but it drives me nuts. You know. <laughs> but is it you specific, or is this um, a more? It's everybody. Know, it's just other, it's uh, everybody. It's everybody. I, I'm not. I'm not special, but you know. So, <laughs> I just, but I don't know how to. There's nothing I can do about it except I, I stopped calling her out on it because it's like she needs it or something. So, I don't know. Yeah, I think. I mean, there are. There are people in philosophy who think that a lot of these kinds of processes they serve some other role, right? Yeah, you know, that. Even if you don't think, yeah, if your aim is, you know, saying true things about the world, this clearly yeah. doesn't work. But maybe it is like they're the stories you want to hear. They're entertaining you. They're making sense of things. Um, yeah, <laughs> there could be lots of lots of reasons for them that are perfectly, you know, psychologically healthy, at least for the person who's engaged in them, even if they're not, even if they are frustrating. Um, yeah, we all have our own <laughs> truth to tell or something. Is, is that the, yeah, that's very modern. Yeah, something post-modern. like that. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> who, who has a better grasp on, on memory? Uh, philosophers, neuroscientists, psychologists, who's winning this, this race? Oh, that's a, um, I don't think, I mean, I'd like to think that it should be some kind of joint enterprise of some sort. Um, who's winning? I don't, I mean, I, I'm not ready to call sides in some, I mean, like, I don't know. And I don't know that anyone could or should in those kinds of ways. I'm glad to have philosophers in the conversation now in ways that we weren't for a while. And that like some of the questions about what counts as a memory or doesn't count or where we want to draw the boundaries, um, I think philosophers can be helpful. I mean, maybe even just especially now, not because philosophy is anything special, but because science, the you know, science is so specialized, right? That you're not just working on memory, but you're working on episodic memory and not just episodic memory, but episodic memory in, you know, Corvids and Corvids on this set of, you know, with this set of measures. And so you can read incredibly widely and still not at all come anywhere near the primate memory literature or the literature on memory in Drosophila or the memory literature for trauma victims, you know, like, you know, and dementia patients, right? There's, it's massive. And so philosophers, by not having to sustain a research program, get to kind of look around and talk about similarities and differences and try to put things into conversation. Um, And so I think, yeah, I don't know that anyone's going to win that I think kind of recognizing that <laughs> recognizing that it's bigger than all of us is probably a good first step, especially for I mean, philosophers need that too, right? And sort of thinking like we don't get to pronounce how things are without actually looking at what the data tell us memory is like. Yeah. Um, Do you see the um okay, so my uh 
actually before we started recording i was just asking you like whether i should how how i would proceed if i wanted to get into like a philosophy department or something but um and so what i'm about to say may, may rub you the wrong way i don't know but the way that i see philosophy <laughs> often is sort of um so you're poking you're the type that pokes holes right and then you poke one hole and that opens up multiple other places where you can poke holes and mm -hmm. so instead of solving anything it seems like the questions become more detailed yeah. more nitpicky and 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 uh, what what you want in science and philosophy is to solve problems, right? But it seems like often philosophy opens up more problems. And I'm wondering if, if how you view that trajectory specifically in the philosophy of memory. Yeah, it's a great question. And so I think I think some I think there are ways of curtailing parts of that question asking process um, that you know, like you can recognize it going in directions that sort of transcend what we're able to measure, just our limitations we have to take seriously. Mm. Um, and that's a lesson I've always taken from doing work alongside scientists um, at different points. It's like, yeah, sometimes you just have to say, like, look, this is <laughs> we want a good definition. You know, we want to well define our measures. We want to well define our criteria. But like once we've done that, we just we're going to stick to it because that's the only way to actually sustain an investigation. And maybe at the end of that, like, you know, it'd be nice if science weren't structured such that like you end up kind of with a lot of sunk costs into like, well, these are the tools we know, right? And so yeah. the retraining or re-exploring, if that were more rewarded, I think would be helpful for everyone. Um, but, you know, it makes sense to stick with the program for at least long enough to see it through, right? At least long enough to see like, what happens if this is the way we conceive of that thing? Mm. Um, so I think I think philosophers, it's good for philosophers who do this kind of work to spend enough time with scientists to recognize the different stages and ways in which the poking holes is helpful and in times at which that actually like is just going to get in the way and you need to like, you know, maybe phrase that in a different way or wait until we've actually seen what happens from defining it in this way hmm. um, as a way of going forward. So I, I do think that that's, um, yeah, that can be, philosophy needs to have that kind of, if, it, if, it, if the goal really is to answer the question, I mean, I think for some philosophers, the questions are their own Right, <laughs> their own reward. Right, um, right. I th there's yeah. merit to that, though, too. I mean, I, th I think that's part of the fun, right, of philosophy is is coming up with a good question. Mm -hmm. But um, yeah. so 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 then, what's your outlook on uh, the philosophy of, of of memory and you know imagination? Um, and mm -hmm. are, are you're not going to be out of a career anytime soon, for instance? No, <laughs> yeah, no. I think we're. I think this is. Um, is really like it's it's in some ways very early days. I think the number of topics that philosophers have picked up on in the kind of memory literature, and of course their debates and views, um, is also is just very limited relative to the range of phenomena that are out there to talk about. So there's going to be plenty of that. Yeah. Um, and for the stuff that I've been interested in about traces, because especially because of all of the optogenetics work on the engram and such like that, I mean, it's just, for me it's an exciting time because you have a set of scientists who are excited about what these new tools are letting them do in a way that is opening them up not to quite not quite to poking holes but to asking questions in a way that like at certain you know in, in certain places and stages of research projects that's not where you're at and so a philosopher is going to be in your way <laughs> and right now somebody who wants to say like but what is the memory trace like that's not getting me thrown out of conversations in the way it might have a decade ago. <laughs> oh, okay, good, <laughs> good. Um, so, so like in your interactions with neuroscientists and psychologists, I mean, is it a pretty friendly uh, interaction, or, or is there skepticism from their side, or you know, how do how do you feel like you fit in there? Yeah, I'm, it's tricky. I mean, I think part of it is making the right kinds of space. So, you know, these are the kinds of things that. Um, philosophers have a different kind of time on our hands and a different kind of way you know, like the sort of space we have for these kinds of conversations are hard to find especially because you know the kind of professional spaces where you would interact and have a conversation with someone about their work there's not a lot of those yeah. um there have been some and they are usually really welcome in part because it takes a while to align terminology and align ways of asking questions and and doing that sort of work uh, my experience has generally been that once you if you build the kind of environment that allows people, kind of gives them the space to have those conversations, they can be incredibly productive. Mm. Um, but it's it, it takes a lot of doing to make that the case. Mm. Um, just because, yeah, the 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 background environments are in kind of 
practices are so different. Yeah. Sarah, what, what, what is the uh, title? What's the working title of the book? Is it Memory Traces, A Hot Mess? <laughs> no, it should be. Although now, like, I don't think they'd let me get away with putting hot mess on the on the cover. Um, it's, <laughs> although now it, now it sounds like a dare and I'm, I'm interested. Um, <laughs> memories Trace, that is the... Um, memories Trace. So. Oh, that's nice. Um, yeah. Well, continued yeah. Uh, success and keep up the good work. And let me know when um, when the yeah. book is ready to come out. Send it to send it along, and uh, we'll have you back on if Absolutely. you'd like to come back on. I would love that. Yeah, that would be fantastic. So thanks for this. This has been great, um, oh. and it's a great resource in general. So this is fantastic. Oh, thank you. I alone produce Brain Inspired. If you value this podcast, consider supporting it through Patreon to access full versions of all the episodes and to join our Discord community. Or if you want to learn more about the intersection of neuroscience and AI, consider signing up for my online course, Neuro AI, The Quest to Explain Intelligence. Go to braininspired.co to learn more. To get in touch with me, email paul at braininspired.co. You're hearing music by The New Year. Find them at thenewyear.net. Thank you. Thank you for your support. See you next time.